Bird, 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 bird! Round Babe was right. Round Babe was right. I'm feeling, I'm feeling spry. Hey everybody, it's October 1st and I'm back in the kennel. And my God, does it feel good to be back in the kennel. I just wrapped up an epic, epic 6,700 mile journey across this country. And I tell you what, you couldn't talk me into doing it twice in a row. I, I would probably do it again next year. I'd forget about how painful my back and butt were from riding all the way across the country and back. But it was epic. It was fun. It was worth it. And I was guided by, geared by, supported by everybody you know, especially my title sponsor, On X, Gunner Kennels, Food Crates, and more. Pike Gear, Boss Shot Shells, Garmin, W Supply, Waltons, OF Mossberg and Son, Four Wheel Campers Model M. That's what's on my truck right now. My K9 Athlete, Gumleaf USA. I had my boots, always got my boots. My Purina Pro Plan was stored safely in a Gunner Kennel food crate. Yeah, that's right. And I drank a fair amount of Leinen Kugels. Now you're saying, what? Well, guess what? The list just got longer. Just got word next Thursday, I go to Lansing, Michigan, and I pick up my first truckload of lining kugels. So there. What else could a guy want? I mean, you know, I don't know. Gunner, Pike, Boss, Garmin, W, Waltons, Mossberg, Four Wheel Campers, K9 Athlete, Gumleaf USA, Pro Plan, Purina, lining kugel. I mean, come on. That's the shortest intro you've ever heard me do, isn't it? So I'm just going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. My title sponsor, Onyx, Gunner Kennels, Pike Gear, Boss Shot Shells, Garmin, W Supply, Waltons, OF Mossberg & Son, Four Wheel Campers Model M, K9 Athlete, Gumleaf USA, Purina Pro Plan, and the one I like the most right now, it's my newest sponsor, Lightning Kugel. I've worked on this for four months, communicating, kind of figuring, eh, I guess it won't happen. And then, boom, I got home to celebrate a 6,700-mile round trip. I get home. I didn't look at my email from my last stop, which was somewhere in northern Wisconsin, right outside of Minneapolis. I slept in a, in a rest area. Didn't check my emails all the way home. Get home completely exhausted. And I got the big thumbs up from Line and Kugel. This is dangerous. Oh, this episode was really interesting because I was I was in North Dakota. I was on a hunting trip, my last my last big leg of the journey. And I'm at a gas station and I meet this lady and she has a whistle around her neck. But I didn't see a dog like a truck, right? I'm like, oh, but she got a whistle around her neck got to have a dog and I just made some small talk with her turns out turns out we're 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 like kindred spirits in the dog world although her dog world I've never delved in but I've judged a lot of them and you're gonna hear all about this in uh in, in just a moment so that's it I mean you know what I tried to do my typical long intro you know how it gets, you know, ah, you do this, oh, and if you need service, you go, oh, I, I just couldn't do it. I had like 18 attempts, so I decided to just read the sponsors' names down the list, and that's all I had the energy for. And at 3 minutes and 49 seconds, that's not bad. Love you guys, love you girls, I love you girls more. Oh, hey, speaking of uh, girls, there's going to be an event coming up here Uh this is going to be pretty cool. This is Women on the Wing from Wild Card Outdoor Adventures. My friend Lori Card is putting this together. In fact, I think I'm going to have both two of my daughters uh, attend this. I'm going to probably run up there with a microphone. It's going to be November 11th, all day. It's a Saturday, and there is going to be everything from field-to-table demos, shooting, uh, some preserve hunting. It's going to be at the Haymarsh Hunt Club in Morley, Michigan. So look up Women on the Wing with Wild Card Outdoor Adventures. 
I'm going to have Lori come on this week. We're going to do a quick synopsis of it. But it's filling up fast, so I figured I might as well put it in this intro. There. I didn't bother you that much, did I? Didn't? No. You, you, you don't want to miss that. You really don't. And you don't want to miss this episode. You don't want to miss anything. What, what, is, what does Clay Newcomb say? I really doubt you're going to want to miss this one, which I never have quite understood because you're already listening to it, so how would you miss it? It seems more appropriate if you were making a commercial. Anyway, so there. That's it. I'm just yammering. Like I said, I'm still a little road weary. Did I already tell everybody I loved him? I think I did. Ah, you know I do. All right, well, as unprofessional as this podcast almost always is, I was going to get beer and cigars in a gas station in Stanley. Um, no, it wasn't Stanley. I don't, yes, the hell, where was it? Yes, it, it was. Oh, it was. Okay. <laughs> I was passing through <laughs> on Highway 2. It sounds like a song, like a Bob Seger song. And I noticed a, a woman with a dog whistle on her neck. And so immediately I said, I said, how, how are you doing? You know, like, how, how are the birds doing? And then I, we start talking, and then Gretchen and what's her husband? Nate. Nate. Gretchen walks over. She recognized me from something or somewhere. I can't remember the, the background of that. But, and then her husband came over. It got all fanboy, and we had to take a groupie up on the gas station pump. I think it was, like, the longest fill-up I ever had. I think we, were in the, I think we, I think we come and neared that parking lot for, like, 30 minutes. You know, so, and then I find out that you've got small, I'm sorry, <clears throat> let's get it right, kleine Munsterlanders. I can do a good German accent if I have to. I can say 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. But we, we'll leave all the German out of it. Um, but anyway, then you were going to say that you were going to be camping somewhere. And I said, we, I said, we got a really nice place. If, if you're going to tent it, tent it in our yard because we got a mowed lawn and a dog running in the backyard and everything. And it was just like, a. then I find out a little your background. I'm like, wait a minute. I haven't had anybody on talking about Munsterlander since I had Chris Hill on like seven years ago. And she didn't want to do it. Because she was like, she was like, I, I, I don't know, how, how do I do it? I said, no, you just talk to me, Chris. You just talk. Now I've got Bobby Carney on the, on the, uh, at the picnic table in the garage because everybody was drunk last night and they're all in the house still. Bobby showed up here at 8 o'clock sharp, hit the driveway at 7.59, as she predicted. And uh, take it a little bit from there. Give your, your kind of Munsterlander history. Well, I got involved in what we used to call small Munsterlanders. Right. Got my first dog in 2000. I'm, I've hunted all my life mm -hmm. since I was a little kid. I come from a hunting family in Iowa. So, of course, it was pheasants. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I decided I wanted to get something different. Went to the library, um, got Gun Dog Magazine out, and saw this beautiful dog on the cover of Gun Dog Magazine after I'd looked through about 10 issues. Yeah. I found this one, and I read about them, and I thought, God, I've got to have one of those. So I went about you know, trying to find one. Right. And, um, and I got one from um, Barb Krieger in Wisconsin. She was one of the few breeders in the country at that time. There right. were really a handful of breeders. Right. And, um, and, and then got involved in uh, training and testing and the whole thing. And then I, ha I had this wonderful male uh, uh, that I thought should, well, I didn't know anything about breeding at the time, but right. Barb was a breeder and she was a really good mentor. So I got a female um, from another kennel and I had my first litter in 2006. And so then I was uh, over, 16 years, I think I had 15 litters, so roughly one litter a year. I'm right. not breeding anymore because right. I'm getting too freaking old. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all, well, you're out here traveling the country by yourself. Yeah, well, I, mean, I do that. I know my friends think I'm crazy. <laughs> I, I don't think I'd let my daughters do it. <laughs> I know. I think Nate and Gretchen are, like, particularly Nate is scared to death that I do these things by myself. I say, well, the best thing that could happen is I drop over dead in the field. You know, right. I mean, <laughs> what a way to go. Um, you know, that wouldn't be the end of the world. That'd be better than, Now, you would, know. Would, the, would the Munsterlander bark over you like the Drothars do? Well, <laughs> you I know? don't know. So we, we could find you, so we could find you? <laughs> I might end up having to be dinner at some point. <laughs> oh, God. But so, it, anyway. That's a, I mean, it is like I've never, there's one other person I've met that's like our age mm -hmm. and female mm -hmm. that goes about it on her own. 
Mm -hmm. I've been independent all my life. Just, <laughs> it's pretty bad. You can, you can care less. <laughs> well, you know, I didn't know much about hunting until I got involved with, with Navda, and I met up with a, a guy that helped me train my dogs thereafter. Yeah. And, um, and so we started doing hunting trips together because he worked seven days on and seven days off, and he couldn't find people that could go on long trips with him. Right. And, and I was a golf professional, and so by fall, I wasn't, you know, in Wisconsin, you're not giving yeah. a lot of lessons at that point in time, so I kind of had my, winter, my fall and winter off. And so, you know, I learned how to hunt a lot of different things that I'd never hunted before with this yeah. friend of mine. And, um, and so that's, I think, a, a lot of it is I, I have plenty of confidence to go and do just, it. Just, <laughs> and, and I have, you know, I'm retired. I have time to do it. Yeah. I can, and I don't have any friends <laughs> where I live that hunt. <laughs> <laughs> so you just make them along the country? Well, as you no, go? you know, most of the friends well, the that NAVDA I have. Well, the NAVDA has been through NAVDA, I'm sure. Well, and people that have bought puppies, like Nate and Gretchen, Nate, or Gretchen bought her first Munsterlander from, from me. You. And, and that's a lot of it is I meet up with people that have bought puppies from me over the right. years. Right, and it's and like that, family. And some I've, in, like, some I've introduced to hunting, which has been wonderful. Yeah, And, yeah. you know, what, one of the big things I've tried to do is, you know, make sure that, first of all, I would never sell, sell one of them to someone who doesn't hunt. Right. And, uh, and then, you know, I try to mentor them, and, and some of them have become breeders and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's kind of I mean, that's the way the, we have to do it. Yeah. You know, in yeah. a small organization. Right. So, you know, so that's how, you know, the, the deal with the hunting and all that. I want to get like a little into the clubs. Like, mm -hmm. so when the Munsties, sure. when the, well, I'm just going to say Munsties, everybody calls okay, them Munsties, yeah, you yeah. know. We the, call them KLMs. KLMs? Kleina, KL. Kleina. M. KLM. KLM. Yeah. All right, I'll remember that. So when the <laughs> so when the, when the Munsties <laughs> or pretty dogs, <laughs> they are they are pretty. How many how many cocklebirds have you co combed out of them this well, week? Well, they don't. You know, they'll pick some up on their ears. But that silky coat doesn't. No, really... it's actually it's a little bit hard. It's kind of a spectacular coat because I didn't think that. Yeah, it's. I'll well, I'll show you when we're done with this, yeah, so yeah. you can see what the dogs' coats are like. But they're a little bit hard. And they shed dirt and everything, but the wow. feathering on them is what will pick sure. up some stuff. Right. And but it's not really terrible. I it's carry like a little I'm, wire comb. It's not like I'm picturing. No. Like, like coming out with every cockle burr from the. F See, that's what I would pick. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I've always kind of had short-haired dogs yeah. because it's like, oh. Well, I have one that has shorter hair than she should, mm -hmm. probably, but she still has the feathers. She doesn't have much feathers on her front legs or back legs, but she has the tail. Right. And the ears, and it's the ears that tend to pick up to the get, most yeah. of it. Yeah. But so, it's not the end of the world. No, I mean, I've got, For I've a got, good dog. I've got a wire-haired visual that you know can pick up. Yeah. But the more I strip them out. <clears throat> like the breeder tells me to, which I don't, the less he gets. And then the coat's really doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah. So, like, he's doing the same thing. He's just getting some by his tail. Well, the, up really, in his ears. the really cool thing about the coat on a Munsterlander is it, it sheds dirt. Now, I literally, I probably don't give my dog this sounds like, one bath a year. This sounds like griffins are hypoallergenic. Well, like, these are not shed, hypoallergenic, I, I know, but, but they do, you, you can put them in the crate. They've been in the marsh or something like that. You can put them in the crate, and by the time you get home and pull them out, it looks like they've been to the beauty salon. Really? It's kind of crazy, but yeah, that's, that they shed crazy. dirt and you don't, you don't have, they don't have any smell. You don't have to bathe them. You know, I, Jeez. if I want to bathe my dog. Are you dog, having litter I, soon? I've been looking for my next no, point. I'm retired. I told you I'm retired, <laughs> but I can put you in touch with good people. Gretchen and Nate are going to have puppies. Um, so, the, so the club, I don't mm -hmm. know that like when I started judging, we, we all, and I think I told you this in the parking lot in, in, in town, when we set up a tracking phase of the of the puppy test, mm -hmm. as judges we like we kind of fret if the chapter didn't do a good job of finding a, a the appropriate feel, like it says in the book. Right. <clears throat> well, I was like, wow, boy, we we could have found a better field. We could have found a better field. Mm -hmm. And then somebody shows up with a a, yeah. a small monster lander, and <laughs> the dog just bings the track. Like mm -hmm. I mean, like every time. Yeah. I think I saw one get a three once. Yeah. Now I saw a lot of them not get pointing early on, like twenty some years ago, but always on the tracking. Right. What What was the history in Germany with them? I, I don't like know well, any of that. I'm not. We don't have to go into the. 
Well, historically, Herr started in <laughs> yeah, historically they they were what they called a Heath Spaniel, okay. and um, and so I don't know that tracking was originally part of the deal. Right. I kind of theorize, you know, their their heads are closer to the ground than any of the versatile dogs. I don't know yeah, if that shorter. makes any difference. Yeah, I don't know. Or if they snuck things in there to build tracking. Well, every dog. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Munsterlanders, not so much. They don't have much input from other breeds. They're, At least not in like recent history. No. You anything know, that we'd know about. Just, just quickly to go back, there were two guys in the Munsterland of Germany, which is in the Northwest, mm -hmm. that had these dogs and were hunting them and were breeding them, didn't know about each other. And all of a sudden they met up one time and they said, you have the same dogs we have. <laughs> and that was kind of the start of, of, they don't have any history on where these dogs kind of originally came from, but there was some kind of spaniel blood. And so- Yeah, it would make sense. Yeah. yeah, and so eventually they started a club back in it, I think it was before 1912. Oh, so 100 years ago. Yeah, yeah. more than 100, because yeah, I went to the 100-year 100, 100 anniversary in Germany. Uh, did you really? Yeah, it was very cool. But um, So anyway, the tra I don't know where the tracking comes from, other than it's extremely important in Germany. The whole thing Recovering is about game. after the shot. Yeah. And, and they consider it very unethical to hunt and not make every effort to find, right. a bird, uh, find an animal. And, you know, it might be... Um, a pig, it might be a deer, it Rabbit, might, they don't, whatever. You know, whatever they're hunting, right. they expect to recover yeah. the game. And that's a big deal. And the dogs in Germany can't hunt unless they are certified as retrievers and they have tests that, that they have to basically get licensed to hunt, which wouldn't be a bad thing to do here. Because I, I wouldn't have a problem if we made it a rule. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you you know, know, we'd get a lot of protests, but like, right. okay, maybe it would kind of really get everybody on board with like, let's make better, let's, or let's not make better dogs. Let's keep the dog doing what it's supposed to do. Well, and let's be instead ethical of putting hunters. blind, you know, yeah. colored, colored glasses on yeah. and thinking, my dog's great. Yeah. You know, but it's really about ethical hunting too. Yeah. You know, I in mean, my it, mind. Everybody, nobody wants to lose it, but it, you're right. And I've interviewed a few people from Germany over the years, mm -hmm. and I'll probably say it wrong, but when you go hunting, you, you, there has to be a dog either with you or available to track something and mm -hmm. find something. It's just not, it is totally, as they say, walk out in the field it, by it, yourself. it is verboten, <laughs> right? Yeah, verboten. It is yeah. not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I've always said, we can make, jokes about all the you know the breeds that came from Germany and, and Europe because there's a lot of issues with all of them that we'll all you know, we'll pick mm -hmm. on this for that we'll pick on this one for that one but we all have them to thank for for the rigid standards exactly that's and exactly right I, I remember the one thing I loved about it was you know if that dog is not up to the centimeter at the withers right he could have passed everything else but exactly. when the breed warden yeah says sorry There'll right. be another one to breed to that'll be the right height. That's exactly right. Right. And because, you know, I'm a breed show judge, so I'm one of the people responsible for measuring dogs, mm -hmm. looking at teeth, you know, making sure that the conformation of the dog is, is adequate for hunting. Right. You know, so you can have a healthy hunting dog and things like that. And, and that's really, you know, when someone buys a small Munsterlander, they can have an expectation of what size or a client of Munsterlander, yeah. of what size it's going to be. Right. And, um, and most of them fall within that range. And, of course, there's always genetics that there's mess always with outliers. you. But, yeah. But, but, uh, but sticking to the right ones to breed. Exactly. Which we in America are famous for not yeah. sticking to. Right. You know? Well, you, you know, you call it rigid, but, but they think of it as just very professional breeding. Not, right. Not professional in the sense of that's all you're doing is breeding, but breeding yeah, not at a high level. Yeah, professional for money, but. Yeah, breeding at a high level. Setting a bar that we're, right. not, we're not even going to think about lowering the bar. Right, exactly. So when, the, when you got involved, <laughs> what was the club in. In, in this country? In this country, it was the Small Munsterlander Club of North America, okay. they call SMCNA. And it probably really got going um, around in, in the early, you know, 2000s. 2000s. Yeah, yeah. They were, they existed before that, sure. but, but it really got, we started to get more dogs and, mm -hmm. and more interest, more interest in the breed. Maybe after that Gun Dog Magazine article, that stuff happens. like that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And um, so I got, I was a member right away in about 2000, 
1989, I became um, the vice president of the club. And in 2011, just as a little background about mm -hmm. where our club came from. Right. Um, in 2011, we were having a, uh, we invited the, or the president of the German club asked to come over. Really? We had been working at trying to get FCI pedigrees for our dogs. At that point in time, the only pedigrees that we had on the dogs were written by the club, um, mm -hmm. whoever was in charge of that in the club, and it happened to be Chris Hill. Okay. And I know Chris. Yeah, you yeah. know Chris. And, um, and then people would get NABDA pedigrees. Right. NABDA would recognize that pedigree, and then right. we could test. And, and at that time, there was a requirement to do an NA test to breed your dog, to pass an NA test. Right to breed your dog. And um, so in 2011, we were trying to get FCI pedigrees to protect the breed from ending up with AKC or something like that, right. where things can run amok with pretty dogs. Right. And our dogs are pretty dogs. They are pretty. And, <laughs> and you know, so that's a temptation Almost for as people. pretty as my little Vivi out there. And she's darling. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but anyway, um, so the president of the club came over, Baron Dieter Yessinghausen was his name, and he's passed away since, <laughs> mm -hmm. but he was a wonderful, forward-thinking individual. Mm -hmm. you know, he was thinking well into the future. Right. And um, he saw that North America, you know, in Germany and Europe, um, hunting could at any point in time be banned. Oh, God. Um, yeah. Because the, the greens are very strong over there. And so he recognized that, that we could be an important resource Right, to keep things going. Yeah. yeah, and to so at in probably in 2010, their club made a regulation because they, their, their club in Germany is the protector of the breed. It's the original club right. of the breed, so it's considered the protector of the yeah. breed. Mm -hmm. And so they made a regulation <laughs> that you couldn't breed with a dog that didn't have an FCI pedigree. Well, we didn't have FCI pedigrees. Yeah. So um, we were looking to get those, and we were also interested in, in testing in the JGHV system, which is the German Hunting Dog Association. Right, right. Because they do tracking and work like that, blood tracking, and right. a lot different A lot more work. on recovery, a, a, a stronger A lot of more emphasis. recovery, yeah, yeah. and people mm -hmm. were interested in doing that. So he, they made an offer in 2011 for us to pursue becoming a chapter of the German club. In okay. which case, that was the only way we could get FCI pedigrees. Right. And my thinking was um, that it was very important to have access to German genetics because that was certainly, you know, where most of the genetics and sure. obviously originally came from. Right. But there are just many, many more dogs. They, you know, they birth probably 1,200 dog puppies a year. Right. So there's just much more <clears throat> um, d we, diversity available over sure. there. So um, we signed a letter of intent to become a, a Londis group, and we started working towards that. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, um, the, the person who was president of SMCNA at that time resigned. Um, and so yours truly became the president of the club. Did somebody grab your wrist and hold your hand up, or did you do it voluntarily? Well, it was the order of things. I was vice president, oh. so I had to become president. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so the board, we were working towards, you know, making a contract and all that and getting this figured out or figuring out exactly how we would do it, mm -hmm. bylaws, all that sort of thing. And all of a sudden, the, some of the board members decided they really didn't want to go down that path. They were very worried about the control German would, Germany would have. Mm -hmm. and, but it sounds like you were embracing it. Well, we, oh. most of us were, but, <laughs> okay. but evidently not, not, not all of not us. Not everybody. So, they, so we had originally decided that in, for, for Germany to be willing to go down this path, we would do the, add the um, preliminary SAT, uh, uh, preliminary um, UT. Okay. What, is, what do they UPT. call it? UPT, UPT. test um, as a breeding requirement. That made it very similar to the testing requirements for German, for Germany. For Germany. And yeah. so they were okay with that. But I think what happened is, you know, some uh, you know, breeders were polled and all that, and they didn't want to have to do that extra testing. And right. they didn't want anybody telling them what to do. 
as you know, most as of us Americans do. are, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. So, if it wasn't know. for those speed limit signs, yeah. we wouldn't do speed limit. So, so anyway, they took away, eliminated that test, the UPT, mm -hmm. and, and then Germany said, well, that's not what we agreed to. Right. And if right. you eliminate that test, that voids our agreement. We are not going down this path anymore because right. you know, that's not where we were when we made this agreement. And so I, you know, as president, I, a couple of us wanted to pursue this, and, and then, you know, the majority of the board didn't. And so I called the president in Germany, and I said, Bernd Dieter, I said, this is what happened. And he said, well, if that's what happened, you know, we, you know, we will never work with that organization again because mm -hmm. they, didn't, uh, they didn't maintain their agreement with us. Right. And the Germans are not happy when you renege on an agreement. No. And they just, that's I not how things. I worked with them in the mechanical world. Yeah, that's not how things work it's, over there. You know, your word is your word. Right, right. So uh, a couple of weeks later, he called me and said, would you consider starting a new chapter? Mm -hmm. uh, you would be the only non-German chapter of our club. And yeah. I, I kind of took a big gulp. <laughs> and I'm going like, this seems to be a big undertaking, you know. Yeah. And so um, I called some people and I said, you know, give me a little time to think about it. I called some people that I thought would be interested. Because you needed to get a core. At least well, you absolutely. Had a, had we had a core. core. So we had a yeah. core of about, so I, you know, we, I knew we had a core and we, it was about 19 people. Mm -hmm. And that was the start of our club. So it, this was all in the fall of 2013. And by right. December of 2000, or early uh, 2014, we were incorporated. Okay. And then it took another year or so before the whole process. You had to have X number, you had to have 50 members mm -hmm. uh, to enter the JGHV, that you became a, a part of the JGHV, but you had to have 50 members and you had to be part of the JGHV to be a Landis group. So we had to get to 50 That's members. That's a lot of hoops you're jumping it, we through. We were jumping through a lot of hoops, but it was all worthwhile. Wow. And the most incredible thing was how, you know, people in, in the other organization is what I refer to it. Um, you know, we're thinking about everything negative about this, but Germany, the, the leadership in Germany supported us so much. I have a dog out in my Once car. Once they knew you were going to keep we your promise. We were serious. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and they have supported us beyond anything I could have ever imagined. Yeah. And by giving us good, really excellent genetics. I have a female out in the car that came over here uh, when she was two and a half years old that had a maximum VGP score, you know, she was, yeah. which was 348. Do, I mean, it, People don't all know the JGHV system. A few system. do, but it's yeah. That is not that doesn't happen. A that lot. doesn't happen <laughs> hard, hardly she ever. She must have went with 11s and 12s yeah. in some departments. Well, and the VGP I mean, is oh, fours, but but oh, you have I'm to thinking. do extra work to get that high of a score, right. which was. But they do have high marks, though, don't they? Can't they even give you? Yeah, all? H's. H's. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. I got to. So anyway, so so that was um, that was how things got started. Wow. So. Um, there were some very key people, and um, and I I became the first breed warden because I had that, the most breeding experience you of the that people. Before we hit yeah. recorder, while we were doing, and I'm like, so how did you did you go to Germany to learn? Did somebody did you have like a dog show background, or how did you? Um, well, that's breed a, warden was different than dog show background, but breed. Breed warden um, it advises. You know, we call it a warden in Germany. Right. Zuchtwarten. Um, but it's really a breeding advisor mm -hmm. is what it is. And so I just had the most experience and the most time available, <laughs> which was a big key because I was retired at that time. Right. And, um, and so it was just a logical person to be right. the breed warden. And I, I had to go every year to Germany to breed warden, the annual breed warden meeting. And that's where I learned a lot of stuff. Did you have to learn a language? No, no, fortunately not. Fortunately, you didn't try to do this there, in the... In the so I sat in meetings and I had someone sitting next to me basically translating things yeah, for yeah, me. Yeah. And the, the it, key stuff, that, because when the Germans say a sentence, it's like so long you can't believe it. And right. then the person would whisper in my ear what it was. I said, all that for, <laughs> for that, <laughs> you know, sort right. of thing. 
it goes but, it goes on like a speech. Like, yeah. Like, what they say? Yeah. These will be good dogs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have a breeding. So I the big thing I had to learn is there's a, a breeding program called Dog Base, and and this is an interesting program. So it basically all the dogs and in, in all the pedigrees mm -hmm. go through this testing system, breed show. Uh, VJP, HZP, and most of them. So this is a puppy, the spring puppy test, the right. fall puppy test, mm -hmm. and Next then the test. utility test, which yeah. isn't required for breeding. Right. And that can be done at, at any age, really. Right. Um, and all that data goes into this dog-based program, and it gives breeding values to different things. Right. So as an example, over here, pointing to the Germans is like not a real big deal. Exactly. Right? Tracking is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. but we So there's breeding values for all these different areas. Uh, lout, which is voice, yeah. tracking, nose, water, mm -hmm. search, yeah. pointing, cooperation, sensitivity, yeah. and then shoulder height and... Uh, Bite, I'm sure, and all that. Yeah. yeah. Um, in any case, I can, we can look at those breeding values and have a pretty good idea of what you're going to get from a puppy. So we would select puppies to bring over here that had, or, or breeding dogs that we would use you right. know, semen on or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and we would put a big emphasis on pointing, cooperation, right. nose, search, the things that people over here right. highly value. Right. If you saw something that was really low on the pointing end, yeah. you're like, we don't need to... That's not going to... Yeah, that's, hears, people aren't going to love that. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, and as an example, we had an HZP test recently over in Michigan, and we, had, we brought over German judges for it, and they were, like, stunned, I think, by the pointing on our dogs. But the I whole thing they is, is they don't really know how to work with it in developing it in the dogs over there. We, we really know better. Yeah. We know better how to do it. Right. And so they don't, they get totally different kind. And they don't, in Germany, they can't put out birds and things like yeah, that. It's, it's a they tough have to place try to, to find. It's a tough place to make some of the best dogs in the world these days. Yeah. It, it's, it, yeah. There's so many restrictions. Well, so bird-wise is the problem. The bird the problem. thing is the problem right. over there. They got plenty of boar or something yeah. else to chase yeah. around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hare, boar, deer, all that right. sort of thing. Yeah, so. So now it's the Kleine Munsterlander mm -hmm. in it group North America, just right. like they would do it. Yeah. Yeah, VDD group, right. GNA. Right. I see that, yep. Did you bring an extra large sweatshirt? <laughs> oh, that's right. We didn't know we were. We didn't know we were going to meet, so you didn't bring. I'm sure the club will. More. I'm sure more. the club will send me one after yeah, all yeah. this. Um, so, all right. My my. I, I knew a breed warden with, with the VDD. Mm -hmm. He was one of my judge mentors, Ken Whitney. Mm -hmm. um, and he would have to, you know, like you said, it's really like an advisor, mm -hmm. especially like with the yeah. with the draughts, It was the coat a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, right. you know, they don't. They didn't want a slick coat, but if it was a good dog <laughs> and it had a slick coat, couldn't be bred to it. You know, there was I exactly. Think, that's what breeding is all about, right? And he would yeah. be able, but I don't think he had any database. No, like because that. I don't think there's any other versatile dogs that use that database. Wow. And but they have, I'm sure they have records that. Yeah, they do. You know, and they can look at a breed but show result. But to be result, able to plug things in and say, and then come up with, so so like as an example, is so cool. Um, you, you put two dogs together, and you're not just talking about those two dogs. Right. You're talking about their entire right. lineage. Right, everything behind them. Exactly. Right. So you're, that's what I try to help people understand that first are getting into breeding. You're not just breeding these two dogs. You're yeah. breeding the families. Yeah, if you're going to breed two dogs, you really need to know who yeah. the parents and the grandparents. And the, yeah. And because the that'll come in. That's what made right. those two dogs. And as an example, I could look at, um, say, a grandmother and look at all of her progeny, all of her offspring, mm -hmm. and I can see how they did in all their tests. Right. I can see any health issues, all that sort of thing. So even though you might have wonderful breeding values in um, in performance things, mm -hmm. hunting things, um, if she's producing uh, um, health issues, that might not be a lineage, a line that we want to go down. Right, and then that and shows up in this. Yeah. This so the database. breed warden. You know, and any breeder can have access to that program, sure. but so far they, they've just gone online with it. 
And so now it's a lot cheaper and more breeders will use it. Right. And now we have to teach them how to use it because right. I had to figure it out on and my own. And this doesn't cover like health things. This is no, all, it does cover oh, health things. it does things. cover health. As well, we have the data. So we have uh, when a litter is born, by the time they're eight weeks old, the breed warden it does a litter inspection. Now we can use a, an agent of the breed warden who could be a veterinarian. Okay. And so we would check for Because you can't just travel 3,000 miles no. across the country all it's the time. It's not, yeah. We're, and, you know, being a small club still. Right, right. You know. So um, we have that data. We look at the puppies and, okay, that puppy's tail is a little short. Or that puppy is, has ectropic eyes or entropic eyes. Mm -hmm. Or uh, something is not right about right. that puppy. It's, it's noted on the, the litter inspection form. And that goes into dog base. That goes into the database. And so we can see, you know. So they're even doing evaluations at that age. Of, we have to. Right, yeah. right. It's, it's like you don't get a, a pedigree unless you do it. <laughs> so <laughs> now, I mean, you can still run in, in versatile dog events mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. But does your chapter or does your club lean more toward the, the VGP and the HCP? The, or do they do we a lot of both? We have to. Well, you have to do that for your breeding. Right. Right. But do you, do you do a lot of the, like, the Federation or NAVDA testing as well? Well, so it's a choice a person it can just, make. If they want... If, some people are like test nuts. You know, they want to get it here yeah. and they want to do it there. We have... There's some people like that, but mm -hmm. most people, it seems like in our organization, are really hunters. Right. And, and, <laughs> Bingo. Yeah. And, and it's... I don't see a lot of... We don't see a lot of that. There's some people that are, that are more... That are, it's not that they're, they're just interested. They like that and that sort of thing. Right. Personally, for me, I do the, I do the testing because I had to. Right. <laughs> and because I thought it was important. But, you know, I, I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't have been particularly interested if, and I qualified dogs that could have gone to the Invitational and NAVDA, but right. it, it just it was no interest to me. I, right. I don't, I love hunting my dogs. Right. I, Training is not my emphasis. Some people like Nate is, is and Gretchen are very much into training. Right. Um, I do it because I need to have a good, <laughs> a good dog. Right. You're, you're doing it for pragmatic <laughs> yeah. reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. so. When did the the traveling yeah. wing shooting starting started for you? How long have you been just journeying out across the country? Because I I saw your license plate. You're not from around here. No, I'm from New Mexico. <laughs> right. And and that's now, what threw me off when yeah. I saw your dog list. I'm like. New Mexico. Yeah, no, and there, aren't, and there aren't a lot of, <clears throat> there's not a lot of hunting dogs. There's a, a Navda chapter, it's like probably two and a half Zia, hours from yeah. where I love Zia. Yeah, and they have the Invitational fairly often, but um, I started when I got my Munsterlander, when I started training with this friend in, that yeah. was the president of the Navda chapter, and, and, and he'd take me around, and that's where I learned to do this kind of hunting. I've been on, I've gone down to the National Grasslands Pier probably since 2000 wow. and I've missed one year one season wow. and I probably had puppies at the time and I couldn't go <laughs> so well, how many dogs do you have I, we didn't get the I have three you have three with you yeah yeah I have a grandmother you must have the a one, system I you should see my car we're gonna get some pictures of that oh yeah you we're gonna get take some a picture inside of that yeah yeah it's crazy and of course because I'm traveling I'm going down to pier from here right and uh yeah where um, have you ever had like, or is there no room in your vehicle for a hunting partner? They have to follow behind you because that's correct. There is no room, <laughs> so, so you never get anybody to help you drive. A, like I just drove no. from Michigan to California to yeah. here. But that was a one-off, yeah. but this is oddly this enough, is every I, year for you. Just, yeah, yeah, it, it's yeah. I'll make probably. Um, I usually hunt in. I'll go back to Iowa. Um, I still have family in Iowa, so I'll go hunt pheasants in Iowa, and I'll probably, you know, I'll do um, sharpies and chickens down on the, down near Pier for five days after, mm -hmm. you know, when I go down there once the rain stops. Yeah. And um, and then I'll I'll I maybe do it. I just kind of depends on where birds are good. You know, like yeah. I've been to Montana. Sometimes might, it's a conversation with somebody yeah, and all yeah. of a sudden. And, and I, you can, you know, it's easy to find out how yeah. things are. So like last year I hunted Kansas. It was kind of dismal. Mm -hmm. and But I know it's better this year. So it's not hard. It's only about right. an eight-hour drive to get up into bird country there. So you must from be northern New, northern New Mexico. I'm then. in, yeah, near Santa Fe. Yeah. 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 Um, hey, let me hit this and pause then I, for a second. Yeah, sure.
All right, I hope you enjoyed that word from our sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> so we're yakking about you know all your traveling wing shooting, mm -hmm. um, but I got I want to jump back like so. Sure. Anybody who does this kind of remembers their first test, right? Oh yes. Oh. And, but so not I mean. I don't know if you went to a clinic first to learn about it, or did you just kind of like... No, I was too stupid to know to do that. <laughs> just... I went to my first... I went to a, a NAVDA chapter, and this is a funny story. Mm -hmm. I went to a NAVDA chapter training day. Right. Well, I have this eight-month-old Munsterlander who was just a, a bruiser of a, a male, a lot of dog, and mm -hmm. huge prey drive and all that. Loved the water and all that sort of thing. Uh, pointing, I wouldn't say was a strong suit at first, mm -hmm. but then I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Right. So I get there and and I go over to s introduce myself to the people that I saw over there, and right away my dog gets attacked by a drothar. <laughs> and I'm going like, oh, well, no. this kind of, and he didn't get hurt, but but it's that but <laughs> he was eight months old. It was never a good thing. Oh. And then I I said hello to this guy who I end up being good friends with, and we end up training together a lot. And the first thing he says to me is, well, that's a nice dog for, that's a, nice, a good dog for a woman. And I'm going like, oh. And you still stayed friends with him afterwards? <laughs> well, <laughs> I needed help. <laughs> so, but the funny part of that is, and he was a drot guy, but the mm -hmm. funny part of that is he eventually had a couple of Munsterlanders. So I really? always told him that it was that was a good dog for a woman. <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> so so I did my first test and and the judges I get my dogs out in the field you know doing the, they do the gunfire right sure. you know once the dog gets going and I have all these judges around me that all these men judges around me mm -hmm. and um, and and they were kind of surrounding me and my my dog came back. And um, which isn't typically what he would have done. Right. And so they deemed him as being gun sensitive. Okay. And so this, so we get all done with the test, and, and the head judge, and I don't remember who it was, um, fortunately, because <laughs> it'd be all right if I said something about it. But mm -hmm. he, he said to me, he said, well, he said, you need to get this dog under control because, I mean, he, he eventually went out and did a great search and all that, right. and found birds and all that sort of stuff and, and this and that. And, uh, and so the president of the club, my friend, can I say his name? Oh, yeah, Dick he's... Jensen, mm -hmm. um, came up to me, and we weren't friends. I mean, I didn't hardly know him at that right, time. Right, right, right. And he came up to me and he said, your dog is not gun sensitive. I, he said, meet me out at such and such a place tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Put the dog. He brought a woe table out. Put the dog up on the woe table. Shot a starter pistol off right next to his head, and the dog had no reaction to it whatsoever. And he said, "See, your dog is not." He was that sure, though. He was that sure. Right. Because well, yeah. that's a, that would be like scary. Yeah. Who does that, right? <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> you know. Like some, so, some movie. So we started training together, and that mm -hmm. dog did another NA test and got a 112. Right. You know. And so they marked him as gun sensitive or gun shy. In that it was probably, probably gun, gun sensitive. sensitive. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. he kept. He then went out and did the whole rest right, of right. the test. Didn't you shut know, him no down. problem. No. So um, anyway, that so that was how I got started with traveling all over the place, learning how to hunt all kinds of different birds, grouse hunting. And, and up always in the based in New Mexico. No, I was in. Oh, oh, I was in said, Wisconsin. That's right. I lived you said in Wisconsin was, I was up say, by Lacrosse at you that tell time. Me that. Yeah. yeah, I lived up because a lot more access to. Testing. Yeah, yeah, and eventually I moved down to Iowa, mm -hmm. uh, which was a little less access. But I, I ended up, um, you know, all my dogs, you know, went through uh, NA tests and utility tests no. in NAVDA before we got involved in the German system. Right. And um, and then I ran, uh, I never, I because I didn't love all this testing stuff, mm -hmm. um, but I did. You it, appreciate it for its value of building dogs. Exactly. In the German. But it just wasn't my thing. Sort right, of thing. right. And, and I'm, you know, not the greatest trainer in the world. But um, I did take my, the, the, my middle-aged dog, Kate, um, through the VGP a couple of years ago mm -hmm. because it was the first year of COVID. And I thought, what am I going to do all summer? <laughs> so. And so every... Every couple, two or three weeks, I'd go up 
and spend about three days with Dick, and mm -hmm. we would train. I mean, the first time I went up, I don't know why, we just were training, and I said, do you think this dog could do the VGP? This was about two months before the test. And I was just kind of poking away at stuff just yeah. for the heck of it, you know, just to see what I could get the dog to do. And so we trained for the next two months and she passed the VGP, wow. which was spectacular because it's a two day test. Yeah. And it's, there's like, I don't know, 16 different activities in the right. test. And, if and they, you're under judgment. And you're under judgment the, the entire whole, time. Right. And, um, and your dog can't screw up ever. And, and we got through it. So that wow. was, it, and it was a real bonding experience between me and that dog. Right. And um, like it, it kind of gives me goosebumps to think about it because I never thought, I mean, I didn't know if I could run an HZP, you know, train for that <laughs> right. test, you know, with blind, you know, you're, yeah. you're doing young dogs, 16, 18 months old, right. doing blinds and, you know, a lot, a lot of all these 300 meter drags and yeah. all this sort of stuff, but it's, if you lay the right foundation with the dogs, um, it's it's not. It's like learning how to learn. Yeah, know. it's it, like it, I can remember when they when S Musterlanders were first running in Navda tests, they you know nobody knew what they were. Right. And and nobody knew how to train these for these tests, and eventually they became you know everybody got a lot better at it, both the dogs right. and the handlers. Yeah, because you just have one, to learn how to do this stuff. It's definitely one of the breed. I you know, and I could be completely wrong on this, but. You know, I've had a lot of griffin breeders on, <clears throat> and they're not happy hmm. about the amount of breeding going on without any governing mm -hmm. or conscious in some yeah. cases. And there's been several other breed. Weimaraner is another one mm -hmm. that, you know, a lot of people bred them back in the day, but they weren't. Or they, when I started with the Bronco Club, I got involved with them. I said, yeah, you know, because there was no NAVDA person mm -hmm. that had a Bronco. So I was like, well, yeah, I'll do it. So I'll help them out. And all, I, wanted to, I wanted to fashion the Bronco Club, or at least my thought was, to kind of do what Bob Ferris did with the Poodle Pointers. Mm -hmm. Like, not that they won't, their purpose wasn't to stay away from AKC, their purpose was to build better dogs. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the, the club just had too many people that loved their dogs more than they loved hunting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sometimes what does it. You know, Nate and Gretchen and I were talking about this the other night, and you know, to me, the thing about our German system and our particular German club, which is right. really strict, I mean, right. it's really strict, um, is that it, it, it makes it so that breeders can't make bad decisions. Which is a great help. Yeah, it's a huge help, you know, because people are, I, 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 was, I, I work with the head of the breeding commission in Germany for a long time in terms of finding dogs to import and, yeah. and, and which ones we might use semen on and things like that. And I told him recently, I said, I said, you know, I made some comment about something and I talked about kennel blindness. Mm -hmm. And and it's a it's a disease it's a oh, it's a real amongst disease. breeders and amongst people. You know, it's like we always say, you know, you can insult someone's kids but don't insult their dog. Right. You know, don't criticize it's not right. an insult, but don't criticize their dog. Right. Because people are just not <clears throat> um, they they're not necessarily looking at things I always very call it, rationally. I always call it, when you meet somebody that, in fact, <laughs> this is funny, that I won't go into the story, I'll tell you later how mm -hmm. we got this place, but the, the couple that owned this, um, he got a call from, I'm not even gonna mention the breed, <laughs> but he got a call from a guy who was looking at using his dog, mm -hmm. and, he, and he told me, he says, I have the best <laughs> in the country. Yeah. Look, like, how do says, you know? Says who? <laughs> yeah. Says who? Everybody thinks they have the best yeah, in the says, country. <laughs> it's leaving the dog, the dog breed blank. I have the best blank in yeah. the country. Yeah. Who says stuff yeah. like that? Nobody yeah. would say stuff like that if they knew what they were doing. Right, exactly. You, you, the, the closer you get to that, say, I try to breed the best right. of this, but yeah. not I. Yeah. When the I goes in it, you got, you got rose-colored yeah. glasses on. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, in our club right now, um, it, we're small, and yeah. and breeders have to support each other. Sure, uh, it's really important because you know we have to work at how can we work these lines right. together. How can we bring in new genetics? You know all that sort of thing. And it won't. It's you can't keep a breed healthy unless you yeah. are really making right decisions. And, yeah. and going back to you know what we're saying is that because we do have a lot of regulations, you know. I, 
the, the, we have something called the Breeding Commission who, if a particular dog is producing, even mm -hmm. though it's, it's basically certified for breeding, right. it's if it starts producing stuff that isn't healthy or you know, isn't good for the breed, right. yeah. they will take the breeding license away. They have the power to do that. Well, yeah, because and, you know, they, they stamp do not breed. Yeah, and yeah. because their, their whole thing is to protect the breed. Right. And, and I like not that. to protect the breeder. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. We should have shirts made up with that. Yeah. But Protect pre the breed, not the breeder. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there. I know their system. The way you said it, I wanted. Oh, I had such a good. It was like boom in and out of my head. <laughs> yeah. That's but, why I interrupt people a lot. <laughs> no, no. It was. It was about protecting the breed. Right. Oh, that's what it was. Like some people say, we're trying to make the breed better. Mm -hmm. Well. We're never want, we never want to take steps back and let something yeah. go like, ah, you know what, they don't swim after all these years. Right. But saying making the breed better is, is a different way of saying it. But some people, some people are just trying to breed for performance but not breeding. And this is to keep the yeah. breed. Right, exactly. And performance is only part of it. Right. Like you, exactly. you can't have a good performing dog if you don't have a healthy dog. Right. And so you've got to pay attention to that. Along our, with temperament. Our breed, that's yeah. just what I was about to say. Yeah. Our breed is known to be a family dog. Mm -hmm. That this is a dog that you can live with in the house easily. They have an on off switch. Or you yeah. go out to hunt there like a ball of fire when you're at home. They're couch they, potatoes. They get it. Yeah, we're yeah. not going anywhere. And, and, it, it's it's a really big deal. So you're looking at temperament, you're looking at structure, right. you're looking at performance, you're looking at health, and you got to put all four of those things together. Right. And if you don't, eventually it'll start. It's going to fall apart. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And you, you lose the breed, and and that's happened to a lot of breeds. I think it's happened to almost every breed. Mm -hmm. Like you could probably let's just take the Griffons. Mm -hmm. You could still find people dedicated to it, mm -hmm. but there's 50 other ones that are just like, mm -hmm. I got a good dog, you yeah. got a good dog, let's go yeah. dance, you know. Yeah, and we think a little bit of ourselves as as doing that in this country because our standards are so high. Yeah. And and it's really hard to be a KLM breeder. Yeah. It, it's, you know, you, you have to recognize that sometimes you have to start over. You, you right. maybe end up with genetics that, that aren't healthy for the breed, aren't right. good for the breed for whatever reason. Yeah. And, you know, we I've I have judged at breed shows in Germany and we have international breed show every year there. Mm -hmm. And I was I went into the ring with the the gentleman who was the, the head of the breeders of the of the breed show judges. No. Yeah. And um and we had this male dog come in and he was trying to examine the teeth. Mm -hmm. And and we do all these things. They actually judge temperament in breed show. Sure. As well as at the other tests. And um, this dog, you know, went, mm -hmm. did this a couple times. The handler and the dog, he stood up and he said, your dog is dismissed. He's disqualified. Mm -hmm. There was no chance that dog would ever breed. Yeah. Because they don't tolerate that They're in just, our breed. Right. You know. And a lot of people would go, oh, he's just, he's just, he's just owly. He doesn't do yeah. nothing. No, there's there's a reason. Yeah. There's a and, reason. And and you know we always instruct. Especially people. when it's the judge and the handler. I'm not saying two dogs passing yeah. by each other can't right. happen, but that 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 should be they should be standing out like they're at Westminster, letting the judge look at them. Yeah, like, exactly. And we tell have, people, have you know, it. we prepare them. We tell them you need to have a lot of different people examine your dog's mouth right. because if your dog does this you're in done. a breed show, you, you can the love dog us is all done. the want. And you it could be, be the greatest hunting dog. It could, but. The characteristic that we want in our breed of being a friendly dog and mm -hmm. easy to live with yeah. is not in that dog. And, you know, so and, that's and that. We don't, and we don't. For don't whatever some, reason. For whatever reason. <laughs> yeah. So, and this is shame on me for not knowing. <clears throat> did anybody ever, and I'm not trying to throw people, well, I am a little bit, but. Under the any, bus? <laughs> under, yeah, right. <clears throat> Has any, I haven't seen them in dog shows. Like, is that. Did they ever go AKC? Did anybody ever well, go you that will, direction? The SMCA uh, club is AKC. AKC affiliated. recognized. Okay. Yes, they are. So, so there are people. Right. And you could always, I think you could always show them in UKC you could, because 
uh, our dogs. Right. Or those, I think uh, somehow the right. people could do that. But they got them fully recognized so they could yeah. do that with their dogs. Yeah. yeah. And, but with and somebody, run AKC hunt tests and all that sort of right, stuff. Right, right. Um, have you ever messed with any of that just to, for the... No, I, just, I like to hunt. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to waste my time with that stuff. I love <laughs> or it. Or my money. I'll spend my money hunting. <laughs> <laughs> on gas. Yeah. On gas for hunting. Yeah. Um, do you remember... I know you said you grew up hunting, like which would mean your dad hunted, your mom might have hunted. Not my mom. Not my mom. <laughs> Definitely not my mom. So you, you're the outlier? <laughs> any sisters that hunt? Or is, I have a, a brother yeah. that hunts. Yeah. And my... my grandfather and my grandmother my grandmother grew up in kansas mm -hmm. and in coffeeville kansas and evidently this when she was young way back yeah this was in the early 1900s yeah. she hunted with guys one of the guy was evidently a national champion probably on some clays or something right, like right, that right. and she would go out and hunt with them mm -hmm. And, and then the other women, and this is when she was probably a late teenager, right. would come out with a horse-drawn hate thing and bring out lunch for everybody. Right. But my grandma was out there hunting. <laughs> See? <laughs> Did you know that when you were a young girl? Uh -huh. Did you, that yeah. had to be, like, yeah. always in there. Yeah. Like, yeah. my grandma was way cooler yeah. than your grandma. My <laughs> grandma just baked cookies. That's yeah. <laughs> no, the, my grandma didn't well, bake cookies. But <laughs> <laughs> that's all my grandma did. We yeah. came from a long line of but bakers. But she never hunted once. Interesting, because back in those generations, she never hunted once she got married and had she had two yeah, sons, yeah. and they hunted, and she thought they should hunt with their father. Yeah, so I but, felt very sad that I never got to hunt with my grandma. I hunted with my grandpa. Yeah. Well, but she, is really she quit neat. hunting, yeah. 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 Do you have kids yourself? Or? I have two daughters. Do you? Yeah. Do they hunt? No. I've t I took them. I tried to introduce them to it, but yeah. it's not something I think you can... I, you I, ha a person has to come upon it and, and like they it. They have to want to. Yeah. Even I, my little brother, he's eight years younger, but he didn't really start hunting until he got in college. He wasn't interested in it in right. high school. But I went out in the field when I was eight years old, and I, I think I was probably one of the retrievers mm -hmm. and flushers. Oh, sure. And you know, everybody had, and I just loved it. I, right. You know, it was the same thing, you know. Yeah, you met my daughter quick mm -hmm. when we were out there, yeah. and I had taken um, a twin, she's a twin, not identical, mm -hmm. and then we have a three year, three year younger daughter. Mm -hmm. And the one that's younger, no interest. She would. She liked to go shoot a BB gun because if she could hit a target, I would take them to get ice cream. Oh, so okay. they were always counting Incentive, on. Yeah. They were counting on Jesse. Oh, what I would do is stand up a clay target, mm -hmm. and if she could hit it with a BB gun, we'd go get ice right, cream. Right. And they're like, "Come on!" Je but she never had to think. The, but the twins, they were just that age when I'd come home with birds or whatever. Yeah. They were grabbing them and holding them, and oh, yeah. and I never got a gun for them early or anything else. They just. They just kind of saw it and they wanted it. Yeah, I don't know. I just I always loved outdoor stuff. I started yeah. playing golf when I was eight years old too, and played. <laughs> they have clubs that small? Yeah, they did, and <laughs> played. You know, started playing tournament golf. I just liked all the, yeah, the all the out, outdoor sort of thing, and, yeah. and I later started fly fishing and things like that. So oh, we we'll get rid yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. Fly. You, so I think people start fly fishing once they have. If, if you start fly, did you fly fish before you? My had my dad dogs? and my grandpa were fly fishing. Okay, then I so, got. I, I retract my statement. Yeah, I pull no, it back in. <laughs> no, I um I learned you know I, t I learned how to do it in my yard, mm -hmm. and and then we went. But he was more bass fishing and stuff like that. Right. And later, and much he just later in the... life, he started trying. Yeah, the rhythm of it. It's right. really in the concentration. I think the same way with hunting. And you golf. know, you <laughs> yeah, you concentrate on a dog. Yeah. You know, I don't. I can't imagine hunting without a dog. I would never be interested in doing that. Right. It would just be a hike. Yeah. It'd be yeah. Called, it's and called it's, hiking. It would be very random. <laughs> right. And and I I can't imagine losing birds and things like that. I I love the dog work. I love watching yeah. what they can do. And that's the fascination for me. Without being a, a giant commercial for this breed, mm -hmm. do, you, do you, is there, you've hunted with a lot of people around mm -hmm. the country. We almost could have got to hunt together this week. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe which, when we're which, done with this. Which you wouldn't have been <laughs> impressed with my talk anyway. I swear to dog, that dog can't hunt over 60 degrees. He lives oh. on my, he lives on my the water. The Bracco? No, the, the wire-haired Vigla. Oh, really? And I took him on in that cold, rainy day. Yeah. Didn't even come in for yeah. water. Yeah. But anyway, um, strong suits, weak suits, or things that you... Well, mine... About the Munstie in general. Like, yeah. 
Well, certainly. Because we know they're gorgeous. Certainly they're, yeah, I mean, mine have, oh, I've had a lot of really strong pointing Munster landers. Okay. But I think I, I have learned some training techniques that really help it. To, um, to get it out earlier? To or get just, it out earlier. Or like foster not, it when it shows like up. Like I don't do, they're, they're very natural retrievers. Okay. Which right. is a lovely thing. That's nice. They love to retrieve. Sometimes I think that's, if a lot of people get a Munsterlander puppy, I think, and, and throw a bumper for them because they love to retrieve. Sure. And that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm thinking, trying to think like a dog. If, if my boss wants me to always bring that back to him. Why wouldn't I bring this back? To why him? wouldn't I bring this back? Or to at him? least so, attempt to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I focus, I always focused a lot on pointing first, get the mm -hmm. pointing really established and, and retrieving is nothing. You do a trained retrieve, whether or not, I mean, whether, like, they, oh, whether you, they need to or not, right. because it's a little bit about other stuff. It's, it's about impulse control mm -hmm. and, and, exactly. lear and learning from yeah. like, Without being the boss, you are the. T it, I love. I took all my dogs to some level of trained retrieve right. because it does put them in school. Right. That's what I like and about it, the process. And with Munsterlanders, one thing I found with the breed is um, I call them social climbers, <laughs> and they want to be so. So they really appreciate a strong leader. Mm -hmm. But if you're not, they feel the need to be. Yeah. And um, and so they do well with structure. And right. rules and regulations, and you have to, you kind of have to. But then they have to have the temperament to accept that too, oh, because absolutely. you could do that with an. That's where the cooperation AYZ, thing comes in. And that has always been my biggest thing. And mm -hmm. like, I will sweat over my cooperation scores to get them right, mm -hmm. because I, at least in my head and what all my mentors have taught me, that I would rather have, if I was going to have a. We never get everything right, like right. every. No, there's desire. no perfect dog. There's as no we perfect say. dog, and no perfect trainer, probably. It, <laughs> God knows. God knows. I haven't met him yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, I I I used to say this just kind of off the cuff or tongue in cheek. Give me a five. I don't know, score one to four. Mm -hmm. Give me a five cooperation and a three desire. Yeah. Because I just want that dog to want to work with me. Yeah. I I read an article. Um, one thing I learned with training, I read an article uh, that a VDD guy wrote about uh, pointing with the puppies. Mm -hmm. And um, in the, so I started, like for instance, this dog Kate out here, I started her on this system. I'd never done a dog on it before. And when they're just very young, 9, 10, mm -hmm. 12 weeks old, you plant some birds for them. Mm -hmm. And you have them on it, and they come in and they point it, and you have them on a check cord. You pop. Or, or if they don't point it, I mean, they don't always point it. Well, they pretty much do. Do they? Yeah, actually, before you screw them up, <laughs> <laughs> throwing all the bumpers. Yeah, they're place. pretty. They're pretty natural. That's great. And um, and then so we pop, we get the bird out of there, and we restrain the dog and let him watch it fly, fly away. away. That's real. Yeah. I've so that. so the, then the dog is not um, chasing, mm -hmm. which for a Munsterlander is a, a big reward. The chase can be a big reward. So sure. with pointing for, I think issues, for any dog. Yeah, know, well, yeah. with dogs that have prey drive. Right, yeah. right. And so so she never, it was so easy to steady her uh, because she never had a desire to chase. Mm -hmm. And so they're more willing to point right. if, they, if they don't have a desire to right. chase. And I, I really liked that system, and I always encouraged my puppy buyers to try to do that. Not, I don't know that many of them did, but like Gretchen did that. She yeah. just had a litter and kept a puppy. So. Oh, I've had a lot of trainers on, and that <clears throat> kind of goes along with uh, more like the European thing. Like, let's say in England, I've had a few English trainers on. They're not in a hurry, and they don't do the, the fun mm -hmm. toss all the time. They just kind of bond with that dog and see, mm -hmm. they let it go. And, and this puppy. is like in the flushing world, mm -hmm. mostly, yeah. you know, the labs yeah. and the cockers. And it's amazing, like, they're, they're, they're like, I'm already counting on this dog loving birds. Right. But it doesn't come with an instruction manual how to handle. Right. So they'll get all this stuff done on the foundation early, mm -hmm. okay, earlier than I would with the pointing dog. Right. They just know when they get to the birds, this is, that's already there. Right. You know. So you know, you know the chase is already there, so you don't need to foster the chase. No, and, right. and yeah. The desire is there. The, the genetics of these dogs, there's, there, I've not seen a Munsterlander without a lot of prey drive. 
And yeah, I can't say I have. I mean, I've only yeah. tested. I haven't hunted with them, but I've tested enough. Yeah, and so it's like you don't have to. You know, you come from the setter world or something like mm -hmm. that, where they put a, a puppy in the pen and let him chase birds and stuff like that to build prey drive. You don't, you, if anything, you need to help suppress it a little right. bit in the monster Which is landers. impulse control. Yeah, impulse control. And chasing control. is controlling your impulse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so I really, I always like that system and get puppies started yeah. with that and then How about, and then hunt them. And hunt, for sure, hunt yeah, them. Yeah. How about water? Does that usually go pretty good for the, in the testing world part of it? Well, it, here's the interesting thing, and one of the reasons that I thought it was so important to be involved in the in the German system is because in, I don't mean to criticize right. Navda, but no, in, no. we in, can in, criticize them. I do in, all the time. In our club. They fired me, for God's sake. In our club, <laughs> um, the, the only testing requirement for breeding in SMCNA at that time was right. the NA test. Right. And um, and so for a dog to go in because they have a retrieving instinct, right? To go in and swim, you know, six strokes and pick up a bumper. I can remember going at my first test. My dog loved the water. Sure. And he was all German blood. I threw that bumper as far as I could because I was going to show those judges, <laughs> you know, how my dog would swim. Yeah. And they said to me, "Okay, next time don't throw it quite so far because right. you had to do it twice. They had to swim right, right. twice, right? Yeah. Yeah. So." So because we have this HZP test mm -hmm. that has a blind retrieve on the water, right. has gun sensitivity on the water with a retrieve, right. and has a search behind the duck. So that's all like the federation that I'm judging for now. They do all that. They, they tailor, tailored it exactly to that yeah. test. So, yeah. so all of the dogs, and then again, most of the dogs in Germany do the, the two-day utility test, right. the VGP. Right. All those dogs are proofed on water. And not easy water work, not jumping in and grabbing a bumper and bringing it right, back right. or they're, not. They're actually doing something they're as a young dog. They're doing serious water work. Right. I mean, I've seen, I, I had a litter a couple of years ago when they did their HZP, we were, on, we were up in Minnesota and those dogs had to have gone 600 yards down a pond searching ducks. I mean, it was unbelievable, wow. the work they did. And th these were dogs that were 16 months old. Wow. You know, and, and that's the whole thing is they have to do it before they do this test before their second birthday. Yeah, that's a toughie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a toughie. Yeah. So um, they have to, you know, a dog has to have a real stable temperament to be able to do that, be able right. to be trained to do right. that kind and of work. And a, then they have to have the instinct a, to do it. still be a kid at heart. Yeah. You know, they're still teenagers Still be a puppy. Maybe, right, right. right. But be serious enough like yeah. I can do this I can yeah. show you I can do that yeah That's so our ask, dogs are but... pretty strong in the water and I would yeah. say that some like I have a puppy that I'd say loves the water I mean right. I was down in New Mexico like can't stay out of it kind of thing yeah well yeah. we were sitting having lunch this was in Jan end of January and there was a, a stream coming down out of the mountains which is you know would be snow runoff mm -hmm. and there was a pool there where we sat down and ate and I let my dogs out and and that puppy, who was at that time about seven or eight months old, got in that water and I could hardly get him out. He was just swimming around, pleasure swimming. That water swimming. was probably about 38 degrees. Right, exactly. <laughs> didn't, didn't make a bit didn't. of difference. He thought it was wonderful. So, you know, that's a dog that loves water. And right. then a lot of them have just enough desire to do, to do to the job. To get a duck. The water just happens to be a different terrain. Yeah, for exactly. Yeah. You yeah. know, so I think there's a mixed bag about how, you know, they're not... Labradors, right? But they have so much prey drive that they'll do any kind of work, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And how some about like it. field search? Now I know the ones I can mm -hmm. picture a few in my head over the years. I always felt they were pretty strong mm -hmm. field search. It's, and it's not fair to say are they hundred yard dogs or two hundred? But there are some dogs that are just genetically. I think they're low mm -hmm. cooperation that go mm -hmm. to the next horizon. What what's What's the field hunt like, kind well, of, in general? Yeah, um, they are um, thorough, I would say. I think mm -hmm. that's a good way to say they're yeah. very thorough. And I think they're, the dogs that I've had, and maybe because they've hunted a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. um, are, will hunt closer in heavy cover, as they should, yep. and yep. then range out much farther in, and they in, seem to just in lighter pick, they, cover. They just do that, yeah. They just do it mm -hmm. naturally. It's like you don't, I don't think you have to so much train them. Right. Um, they, like, th I have a dog out here, Kate, who um, I was hunting um, sage grouse in Wyoming last year. 
Mm -hmm. And um, she was she started smelling birds and was kind of weaving into the wind on these birds. And pretty soon she was out there about 500 yards, mm -hmm. and she stuck a point. And she was on a ridge top, and I was <laughs> she stuck this point, and um, and she's so solid on point and such a cooperative dog that I got up there to shoot those birds. Wow. And so it just depends. It's kind of where their nose takes them, right, I think. Right, right. But that's, you know, if you, if you have them solid on point, well, you can let them go as far as they want because that dog did not bust those birds. She, she right, knew how to handle them. Right. You know? Is there, is there one bird that you enjoy hunting more with them? Because, like, everyone, can't, everyone loves being out, out west. Mm -hmm. And I still love hunting pheasants. If I can, you know, mm -hmm. not, not, I don't want to be in an area with too many pheasants, mm -hmm. but I've always felt like a dog that can handle a, a, a wild pheasant, a good wild mm -hmm. rooster, yeah. is a pretty smart dog. Yeah. You know, and not get frustrated by it, not overdo it. And, yeah. This, this breed to me is incredibly intelligent, um, and they have a very superior nose. So I've seen my dogs sent birds at probably easily 100 yards. If the and conditions obviously if, have to yeah, be. If you, yeah, right. yeah, you gotta have the right The wind, wind wasn't at the dog's back. No, no, obviously that's, no, <laughs> no. you've gotta have the wind, of course. Right. And, and it's gotta be the right kind of wind. But, right. um, I, what you're almost surprised I, though, it's sometimes what you're saying. It almost sounds like you're like, wow, I can't believe they made game that far away. Mm -hmm. No, I'm that, not surprised anymore. No, no, no but, but people, you were. Other people are usually surprised. <laughs> right, right. I was training with a guy one time and my dog, this other dog that I had, she's gone now, but um, she went on, he wanted, he wanted to practice backing. And I said, well, I'll take beans because she just backs naturally. I mm -hmm. never have to train her to do that. And so she went on point and, I, and he said, well, that bird is, you know, because he had planted the bird, that right. bird is 50 yards up there or 100 yards up there. I said, I know, but she's smelling that bird and she's on point. <laughs> no, she can't be. I said, yes, she is. You know, and this is a guy that had, had sh you know, short hair mm. and was now getting into Monsterlanders. And I said, no, this is, you know, she's on point. So if you want to have your dog come in back this, <laughs> this back, she's doing it, <laughs> you know. That's... And, um, but, you know, I just, they, they really do have good nose. I, I right. digress. What were we talking about? Well, I was just trying to think strengths or weaknesses. Oh, which birds do I like? Oh, uh, that. And yeah. Is there I, a bird you like hunting the most yeah. with them? I like. You know, Nate and Gretchen asked me, and Nate asked me that the other night, and I said, well, I like them all. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, um, I really love Sharpies and chickens. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. They're, they can be difficult for the dogs, and, um, and, you know, like Kate knows how to handle pheasants. Mm -hmm. Yana, her mother, last night, um, we got accidentally into some pheasants, and, mm -hmm. you know, she re relocated two or three times on those birds and, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. And, and um, so I think that's fascinating. Pheasants, pheasants are hard for pointing dogs, but that's what I grew up with, first of all. Right. I think I'm, I'm probably less interested in pheasants than I used to be because I've hunted them so much. Right. And, I, uh, and when I went down to New Mexico, I started quail hunting. And, oh yeah, and, that's a big. That's and so the, the yeah, thing that's there. all there is there. <laughs> Other than there's some dusky grouse up in the mountains, but that's that's, a, that's hard. That's hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I I do like the prairie grouse. Yeah. You know, I having mean, been like, lost in the I, north woods I on rough grouse, I don't love that so much. <laughs> I, I'm I, yeah, I'm not. I leave one of my collars, TT 15s in my truck as dog number two. Yeah. So that way. I, I can, I get lost in a woodlot. I do. Oh, um, yeah. But I mean, I like I like this because I don't like the hills as much. But once you get used to the hills, when you get yourself in hill shape, it's easy walking out here, and you get to yeah. really watch the dog yeah. a lot. Where some of those, like I've hunted Iowa a couple of years ago, and we're just hunting these waterways that were four foot yeah. tall grass, and, and that, you don't know what your dog is doing. You have no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and so with pointing dogs, it is it's very helpful to know what they're doing, especially right. if you have young dogs. Right. Right. Yeah. So do you typically take one dog out at a time? Yes. There? I don't, I never, you know, I haven't, it's like, what do you do if I got a dog on point way over there and another one on point way over there and right. I'm hunting by myself? Yeah. It's like, and, and the other thing, it's a lot less wear and tear on the dog. Right. I can focus on just one dog at a time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, you hunt with other people, but I don't hunt with 
I mean, lots of times I'll go hunting with people and we just go different. Out here, you can just go different oh, yeah, directions. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll just meet you back at yeah, the truck. Yeah, because it's, you so know, you're still hunting it's, it's by like yourself. finding a needle yeah. in a haystack right. out here to find birds. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a lot of work, and mm -hmm. um, and that's how we do it. But I usually, I only hunt one dog at a time. Yeah. I like having three dogs. I, I don't need it as much as I used to because I used to be, I'm a bad enough shot that I can have to hunt all day. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. other day I, I finished up really early. You just <coughs> never know what it's going to be with me. But um, but then I, you know, if I'm like, this is a two week trip. Right. You know, and if you had only, you know, if you were hunting all your dogs together all the time, you just wear them out. Right. And then they're not, right. you know, it's, it's hard on them. So you hunt a dog two, couple hours put them up, get yeah. a fresh one out, and so on and so forth. Now, like I was talking about heat tolerant, I'm just gonna say, because I would think the, mm -hmm. their coat, you said it was kind of like a, almost a self-cleaning, it doesn't mm -hmm. get stinky. You have, would you have to watch the heat with them too? or there, Because it, I've had dogs that were well-coated yeah. and could take the heat. I never mm -hmm. could understand it. Do they take the heat pretty good? Yeah, well, from a structural point of view, mm -hmm. um, the way this works, and this is one of the reasons why, to me, the breed show is an important thing, because, and that's a requirement for breeding in our club. Right. Um, in that, so the heart and the lungs are inside the chest cavity. They better be. <laughs> yeah, and um, the bigger the chest cavity, the easier it is for that dog to cool. Okay. And um, because it's not so crowded in there. And, hmm. and so a deep, spacious chest allows for a dog to probably run cooler. And so, for instance, my Yana, who is, uh, has one of the longer coats of my dogs, and mm -hmm. Hank, her, her grandson, run much cooler than the, my Kate, who actually, if I just, I just carry a lot of water, and so right. she'll keep going. Take a break, drink some water. Oh, I don't usually even take a break, but just she, keep can, some she water. can run, yeah, just keep them watered, yeah. and she comes into me for water. Oh yeah, this one drives me yeah. nuts. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, but once she gets going, then it's less important to her. Yeah. You know, but in the beginning, it's like we got to water her every five minutes sort of thing, and, and I said, yeah. now go hunt. And then once she gets into birds and stuff like that, she doesn't care about water. But it, it, there's, you could look at the build of these two dogs and anticipate that, um, that one is, is a little bit, you know, one can yeah. run cooler than the other. Hi. Your dog food's outside if you need anything. Oh, that's no problem. Yeah. Um, so, so some, you know, it, that's why it's important to have well-built dogs. Right. Um, and so some run warmer than others. And I've heard of Munsterlanders that, that don't handle heat very well. Right. And, and it could and just be a, yeah. the wrong depth of chest, so it to might speak. Just, yeah, it might just be right. that. Right. You know. Yeah, I've never heard that. I'd, I'd be interested to dig into that a little bit. Because I can't figure uh, maybe out Maybe I just made it up. I don't know. Well, it's all right. <laughs> we're, we're almost as bad as fishermen, right? Yeah, really. The, no, I really think that's true, actually. Yeah. Well, I know, you know, you see the performance dogs and field trials. Mm -hmm. They're always, like mm -hmm. said. I have a book in my car I'll show you that will tell you about that. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, you know what? Let's do Let's go out and see some dogs. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks for popping hey, up here. Now, you're time. heading south from here? I'm going down to Pier. Right. Yeah. I'm meeting up with um, Tom and Vanita Skinner, who you probably know yeah, from Michigan. Did... Yeah, I know that Tom name. called me last night. So, so... From the Highland chapter? Yeah, I don't know, uh, but I know he said you probably know. He said I know that guy because I yeah that name I just told jumped Anita at me. that I was gonna I had to do you know I was doing this not had to yeah, I was yeah. doing this podcast in right. the morning and then I would and yeah, I didn't know if didn't, I'd hunt or not we didn't and pay then go <laughs> yeah, right right <laughs> and, and you're not going to get a check in the mail <laughs> no okay well I get that <laughs> I've been a volunteer in this organization it sounds for a long like time. your whole life has been volunteering since yeah, you got into dogs a little bit yeah, yeah. it Once, got me out of of making money and into <laughs> being a volunteer <laughs> but you know all for like you said the, the betterment of the breed yeah I just love these dogs yeah. and it's just uh, I think they're and so you'll just give it everything you can yeah and it's important to me that they right. that they prosper and when you see another couple that wants to get into this mm -hmm. you're gonna will you be pretty are you I'm gonna say could you be a heavy-handed mentor and say ah, ah, ah. no no not so much I'm you just yeah. hope maybe you're led by example and they're just gonna do so, it. so do uh, uh, about what? No, I mean like if, let's say you said that uh, Gretchen and Nate mm -hmm. are, were going to breed. Yeah. Do you, 
mother hen them about what to do or if they just picked it up from you or do no, they you know do they, they consult you they consult me okay yeah yeah and and I try to share as much as I can because I had a mentor who I would never be I would have never been the breeder that I was yeah um, without having that mentorship so I, I talk about stuff right I talk about a lot of the things that we've talked about and, and, and then as friends, it gets talked about again, and, yeah, it, and it, exactly. it sinks in. Yeah, and yeah. people get So it's involved. not like you have to like snap the whip at them. No. They've, they've been absorbing all you this, know, just people, like you did. People gravitate to our club because of the high standards. Yeah. And so there's an easier way to be a breeder of this, this dog than our club. There's, right. Every other way is easier. Right, every other you way. Know? And yeah. so those kinds of people are the ones that gravitate towards us. And so it's easy. It, you don't have to be heavy handed. Yeah, it's like they already got, have that in them. They want to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Exactly. You didn't, it wasn't the recruiting yeah. station at the yeah. mall. Yeah, and it's kind of like you know sometimes you <laughs> that might. That makes that makes total sense. Yeah. They already know going into it. This is not going to be easy. That's why they choose it. Right. Because they they appreciate that they're getting a terrific dog. That's how right. it starts with people. Right. And then they find out how terrific it is, and right. then they want to get involved in in helping the breed continue that way. Yeah. So. Yeah, my early history, yeah, I, I knew that, like my beginning, I knew they did this with all the draughts and, right. and all the Kurtzars, right. and now I see it coming in. I, I think it's really strong. I think it's really cool because I've always appreciated what they, and I said in the right. beginning, I said, we've got dogs here today because of their standards. Yeah. So you guys are holding up the standard. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's um, and, yeah, and, and hopefully making it stronger in this country. Right. You know, not, the, you know, just the, the whole system helps. Well, Bobby yeah. Carney. Yes, I'm sir. I'm glad we've met. Nice to meet you, I Ron. wouldn't be surprised if we hunted together, maybe next year if you're up this Absolutely. way. Absolutely. And uh, maybe a Christmas card and maybe some pictures. Yeah, and, we'll exchange and, information. Uh, who knows? Yeah. I've been thinking about the next dog. It'll be a couple years away, but now I know somebody. <laughs>